why do you do all this? Why did you get into it and why now you're still in this battle, in this fight? I'm, I'm, I was so shocked and, and frightened in a way by what I saw happening in Ladakh and Bhutan where I saw people who had lived side by side for 500 years. There had never been group conflict. And I saw step by step how the economic system created such fear that people were literally exterminating each other. And they felt fear for their survival. I think I, you know, even Buddhist grandmothers said to me, we have to exterminate all the Muslims or they're going to exterminate us. And this is what they'd been told by, by their teenage grandsons who were, had become so angry and so frustrated by what was happening. They'd been thrown into this intense competition that's what this dominant economic system does. It does not engender in any way real collaboration and interdependence. And um, I also saw that every step of the way, this system was increasing fossil fuel use and pollution. And so I realized there's no way to escape either climate change or violent war and conflict. So I just became very motivated to do what I could to raise awareness about the fact that there is a path towards nature, towards community that actually can work. You know, that's what both Bhutan and Ladakh demonstrated to me. There was just no doubt whatsoever that people mm -hmm. were happier and more at peace with themselves, with others, and with their environment. And I, you know, I realized that we can't go back and that we wouldn't want to go back because there are certain tools that we can use. And above all, what we have also gathered ourselves is a lot of information and news from around the world that shows that there's also a lot to learn from each other in terms of that path of, of localization. Do you think you've seen an obvious change in the world in the last 10, 20 years. You know, what's happening is that many environmentalists who were just focused on protecting the forests, protecting the seas, are now looking at focusing on the economy, and that's vital. Because the economy is what unites the social problems with the environmental problems. That's where we have the potential to really reduce or eliminate most of the problems we have. If we think about the economy, what is it? The economy is how do we use nature and people to meet our needs? Constant growth uh, you know, is ridiculous. People need to be aware that what is growing is the wealth and the profit of fewer and fewer people. The growth doesn't measure growth, it measures breakdown. You know, mm. GDP goes up with commercialization. If we pollute the water so badly, people have to buy it in bottles. That's good for GDP. If people have more and more cancer and have to have chemotherapy regularly, that's good for GDP. Mm -hmm. If you decide to stay healthy and plant a garden, that's unpatriotic. It, GDP will go down, will that's suffer. bad for GDP. Yeah. One of the best areas to look at if you want to become eco-literate is food and farming because it's so clear that as this modern economy started invading places around the world, what was pushed for was this, the fundamental thing was producing for export rather than for your own need. Mm. But we have to remember that these ideas came in at the same time as colonialism and slavery, and that all the time there were these global traders that were gaining huge amounts of wealth and power by creating that dependence on global trade mm. on both sides of the divide. For generations, our governments have been subsidizing farmers to use fossil mm. fuels yeah, and technology, right. and all the time, and every step of the way, every business, every activity is being encouraged to use more energy and technology and to employ fewer people. Mm. So relative to the technology, the human labor becomes too expensive. And so we're getting so we can't afford ourselves. And it's completely linked to that everywhere in the world, local food will cost more, almost without exception, than food from thousands, even 10,000 miles away. Mm. 
And that's only possible in a manipulated economy. Jobs are being concentrated in fewer and fewer cities, and people who want to have employment are forced into more and more inhumane conditions. It's disastrous for humanity and for the resources. So what we're talking about with localizing is reversing this towards starting to strengthen smaller towns and cities that remain in balance with the land around them. People feel now guilty about being unhappy when the incredible impoverishment we've experienced is being cut off from community, having virtually no time, is so time poor, we've been cut off from nature, from the deep connections that make us human. We have been mm. dehumanized, and so we're deeply impoverished, but we're told we have everything, and so people feel terribly guilty about their unhappiness. They also now, on top of that, are told, you are the reason for climate change, and you are making life on the other side of the world for these poor people who have not contributed at all impossible. And you are the one who keeps persisting and driving your car and getting into a plane. And, you know, it's your fault that we have climate change. It's completely false analysis. It doesn't talk about the fact that government made arrangements with big business to take factories away from the industrialized world, move so much of the production to so-called poor countries, and with it, dramatically increase the ecological footprint, the CO2 emissions, massively, geometrically. No discussion of that. Al Gore said nothing about it as he announced the problem of climate mm. change. On the other side of the world, People actually have a lot more time than we do. They have more community. They mm. have more connection with each other and nature. But they are being marginalized. They're often now being put into these sweat factories to produce for us, not because we chose that. We didn't choose to have our jobs moved over there. Uh, but that uh, is not improving the quality of life there. But also, at the same time, they're being led to believe that we live in a paradise, that we really do have everything, and we do have community, we have mm. the amount of time that they have, and, and we live in a paradise, and they are stupid and backward. We have you know, evidence that we can increase productivity from land, increase productivity in forestry and fishery and farming, while simultaneously reducing, massively reducing pollution, restoring biodiversity, restoring meaningful livelihoods, many more livelihoods. It is such a win-win-win strategy because also in that more human scale, diversified production, closer to the land, you're also rebuilding community interdependence. Mm. We're talking about restoring fundamental patterns in how we evolved as human beings. We evolved in intergenerational community. We evolved deeply connected to the plants and animals on which we depended. And that engendered a type of responsibility and a type of care that is absolutely vital. It's not a guarantee for that, but it creates the conditions for very compassionate, caring relationships between human beings and between human beings and the natural world on which they depend. Love it. Love the vision. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I really hope that you will think of joining the global localization movement, which is a movement that's taking us systemically towards nature, towards community. We need to be eco-literate, aware of the fact that the economy, the economic system right now, is taking us away from nature. And eco-literate is also ecological literacy. We need to realize that nature actually needs more people now to nurture back to life the very soil, the seeds that really are adapted and life-affirming. So there is a really positive movement out there that's a win-win-win strategy. So I hope you will join us. I hope you will look at our website, localfutures.org, to find a lot of examples of inspiring initiatives and something that will give you tools to get going today to join a really powerful 
and joyous movement. We call it the economics of happiness.